Nevermore Hollows is filled with people who choose to ignore the paranormal occurrences that are frequent in this creepy little town. To accept the idea that evil is a real force, or more precisely, an entity that can exert influence over them, would force them to consider the idea that monsters and spirits and demons and witches are also real. And that scares them. Because if they accept the dark truth, then they know that they are not the alpha predator on this planet, but in fact the prey. Sheriff Mosley used to be one of these people. Until one night as a young man at war in a foreign country, when a devil walked out of the dark desert and tried to steal his soul. I am Lafayette Faust, and tonight I will tell you Mosley's story. It is strange, disturbing, and the creature that attacked him in the desert is unlike any that you've ever heard of. With that, I invite you to sit back, turn on a light, and prepare yourself. It was one of those rare, quiet nights in Nevermore Hollows where there were no reports of strange beasts or mutilated bodies used in ritualistic killings or creepy children with soulless black eyes. It was likely due to the fact that Nevermore was experiencing a snowstorm, which was rare for the tiny coastal town that was surrounded on three sides by the deep woods of Dunwich Forest. Sheriff Cotton Mosley drove the icy streets, watching fat snowflakes fall out of the black sky. They swirled and flitted as if they were alive, dancing to some chaotic melody that Mosley couldn't hear, ultimately settling upon the foot-deep layers that covered the sidewalks and tops of the businesses that lined Main Street. It was only 9 p.m., but all of the businesses had shut down when the snow began, knowing that snow in Nevermore was such a rare occasion that it would keep patrons at home. The ornate street lamps cast jaundiced pools of light down the empty street, causing the piling snow to look as if it were bursting with infection. In the passenger seat of the cruiser sat Alyssa Hart, the town's coroner, she was Mosley's closest friend and confidant. She knew of the dark nature of the town, had the scars to prove it, and would on occasion ride along with Mosley when she didn't have bodies on the slab back at the morgue. She was 50, had shoulder-length red hair and hazel eyes that gleamed with the spark of curiosity. She did not allow the darkness of this town to taint her soul. Instead, she thrived on its strangeness and made it her mission to understand all that she could about the supernatural creatures that preyed on the townsfolk. She felt that the more she knew and could share with Mosley, the better they could protect the town. Anywhere else, snow is beautiful, wondrous, and has the ability to quieten the soul, Mosley said. But not nevermore. Alyssa looked at the diseased-colored banks of snow and nodded. Could be the lighting. While this did play a role in the sickly-looking snow, she knew it was more disturbing than that. It was as if the purity of the flakes were tainted once they touched Nevermore's soil. Maybe, Mosley said. When was the last time there was a snowstorm in Nevermore? We've had no real snowfall in the ten years I've been living here. This isn't the norm. Elissa plucked her cup of coffee from the cup holder and took a sip. The last time anything like this happened was over a hundred years ago, she said, and even then it was only about six inches. There's easily a foot out now, and it's still coming down. At least it keeps the crazy at bay. Mosley nodded. For now. You know, Cotton, we've been friends for a decade, and you know my story, even the part before I came here. But the only thing I know about you before you showed up here in Nevermore Hollows is that you were in the military. You ever going to let me in on any of that? 
Cotton Mosley was a private man. There were only three people that he allowed to be close enough that he could call them friends. That was Alyssa, a paranormal detective named Tiberius Poe, and the owner of Winona's Waffle Hut. There were many others that he cared about, but only those three did he feel comfortable sharing the details of his personal life. Mosley turned off Main Street onto Kuntz. You've never asked before. Why now? Elissa shrugged. I figured sooner or later you'd tell me, but since you haven't, tonight's as good a time as any. The deep red glow of the dash lights washed over Cotton as he considered where to begin. Well, as you know, it was the Army. I joined up right after the attacks on the World Trade Center. I made sergeant and was sent to Iraq with a squad that was tasked with going into the villages to make connections with the people in the hopes of gaining intel that would help us root out the various enemy factions. We got to know the villagers pretty well, and as they began to trust us, they began to tell us things that seemed fantastical and strange. Elissa was intrigued. You mean supernatural things? Mosley nodded. Yes, and at that time in my life, I didn't believe in the supernatural. Thought it was ludicrous and superstitious and small-minded to think that there is a spiritual realm. But when I look back at how I ended up here, I have to believe that I was meant to go to Iraq so that I could experience the paranormal there so that I would be prepared for what we're dealing with here and nevermore. I believe that we're shaped and prepared for our future battles, Alyssa said. So you're a young man who leaves the secular comfort of the West where we no longer believe in a spiritual realm and you end up in the middle of the desert in a country where the spirit realm is seen as very real and extremely dangerous. It only makes sense that the villagers would tell stories. I mean, it's a fundamental belief for them. Yeah, Mosley said, but... I was still so westernized that I couldn't give any credence to what they were telling me. But that all changed one night about three months into my first tour. Lay it on me, Alyssa said. She took another sip of coffee, waiting for Mosley to gather his thoughts. After a moment, Mosley seemed to decide where to begin. There was this one village that was farther out in the desert than the others. There were maybe a hundred people living there. Beyond that village was nothing but empty desert. These folks were simple in the way that they approached life. Good people, close-knit, but chose to call me and my squad friends. One night, we were sitting around a fire with the elders, and some kids came running up, terrified, speaking rapidly in Arabic. What time of the night was this? Alyssa asked. Around 11 p.m., Mosley said. And I don't know if you've ever been in the desert at night with no real ground light from nearby cities, but it's unlike anything else you can experience. The night sky is so massive, and there are so many stars. It's humbling because it makes you feel small, So finite. The dark landscape beyond the campfire light presses in on you and seems so threatening, keeps you always on edge. Kunt Street was lined with craftsmen and Victorian homes, and the sickly snow seemed to soak in the light that shone through their windows. Alyssa had the disturbing thought that the snow was some massive alien creature that was assembling itself here and nevermore, and whose purpose was to devour all the light, leaving the town in pitch-black darkness. A chill slithered down her back. I've never been in the desert, she said. I can only imagine how disturbing it could be, especially under the circumstances of war. 
Mosley turned off Kuntz onto Eldritch Lane. So these kids were terrified. Their eyes were wild. The youngest one looked to be about seven, and he was crying. All of them were shaking. One of the elders, a wizened man named Hamza, spoke with the kids. I could follow Arabic if they spoke slowly, but they were speaking rapid fire. Of course, my men and I jumped up, guns ready, thinking that one of the various enemy factions was headed our way. But Hamza finished speaking with the kids and sent them to their huts. He then turned to me and said something, and I'm not going to lie to you. It sent a chill all through me. What did he say? Alyssa asked. She was hanging on Mosley's every word. He said that a devil was coming. After a long silence, Elissa said, If you didn't believe in the supernatural at that time, why did it affect you so powerfully? Mosley shook his head as he considered his response. Uh, maybe it was the oppression of the massive night sky or the ominous darkness of the desert beyond the campfire, but my first thought did go to the supernatural. I mean, it was clear on his face that he wasn't speaking about anything human. He was terrified in a way only the supernatural can cause. Anyway, before I could say anything, we heard something. The devil? Elissa asked. Well, that's what I thought, Mosley said. But Hamza said it wasn't. But I could see the fear on the rest of the elders' faces. I pressed Hamza for more information. Instead, he told one of the others, a man named Nabil, to run and get a woman named Yadira. Let me guess, Elissa said. She was the local witch doctor. She was, for lack of a better term, Mosley said. I'd met her before. She looked as old as the desert and hobbled along using a walking stick. Nabil ran to get her, and we continued to hear this noise coming from the desert. It was getting closer. It sounded kind of like a jackal, but not quite. When those things howl at night, it literally freezes your blood. My men had spread out, guns ready, the lights attached to their weapons shining into the desert toward the noise. And then we saw it. There was a long pause as Mosley's memories transported him fully back into that moment in time. Elissa didn't push. She waited patiently. He finally continued. At first, we didn't understand what we were seeing. I mean, it was clearly a jackal. That much was clear, but it's how it looked that caused us to doubt what we were seeing. It crept into the light, stood about 20 yards away. Its body was skeletal, twisted, hunched. Its head had been cut clean in two. From the neck up, it only had half its face. It lowered what was left of its head, its tongue lolling down, dripping bloody drool. Its only eye darted from man to man, as if sizing us all up. Then, it settled its eye on one of my men, a guy named Garrison. It raised its head and attempted to howl as it, it came out as a, a loud, gurgling growl. Blood splattered from its throat onto its fur and the ground. That's what we'd been hearing as it crept up to us. That's terrifying, Alyssa said. It should have been dead, but wasn't. Mosley's eyes were fixed, piercing back to that night. Yeah, there's no way it was truly alive. I mean, we could see it was missing half its brain. 
Anyway, suddenly it shot toward Garrison. My men opened fire, but the damn thing was so fast, some of our bullets hit and caused terrible damage to its body, but it didn't fall. It jumped onto Garrison and used what was left of its snout to tear into his throat. I've heard men scream in fear and pain and death while in battle, but I've never heard a scream like Garrison's. It was filled with abject terror. Did Garrison make it? Alyssa asked. No. We kept shooting the damn jackal. It took round after round, but it kept gnawing at Garrison's throat, killing him. Then, suddenly, Nabil came running up, dragging Yadira. When she saw the jackal, she reached into a leather sack that she was carrying and pulled out a carved statue. She pointed it at the jackal and began saying something in rapid Arabic. I couldn't keep up, but the jackal raised its head, gave a gurgling scream, and fell dead. But the jackal wasn't what Hamza was talking about, Alyssa said. Was it? It's not the devil that he was describing. Mosley was a man currently inhabiting two separate places and times. He was completely reliving the night in the desert, but he was still present enough that he continued to drive. Elissa knew he was capable of both, but kept an eye on the road just in case. No, it wasn't, Mosley said. But Hamza was right. What walked into that village next can only be described as a devil. Tell me, Alyssa said, realizing that this was probably the first time Mosley had even spoken of this, that he had held it in these two decades, and that finishing his story would be cathartic. Hamza and Yadira would later tell me that what we fought was a nas-nas, the unholy offspring of a human and a djinn. What made it so weird, yet so disturbing, was that it was only half a man. It looked like someone had taken a scimitar and sliced him right down the middle, leaving only his right side. Just like the jackal's face, we could see organs and bone and tissue and veins and intestines. But none of it fell out. I suppose due to the dark magic that kept it alive. It was covered in tattoos in Arabic script. It was naked and tall, easily six and a half feet, and it hopped around on its one leg, which was massive, muscular. And what we were to find out, and is backed up with Arabic lore, is that though it's only half a man, it is supernaturally quick. It's powerful, and it's deadly. I take it that you shot it, Alyssa said. Oh yeah, we shot it. But just like the jackal, it was unfazed. We must have emptied 500 rounds into it. But it healed as quick as the bullets hit. Its arm was long and rippled with muscles. Its fingers were thick and powerful and ended in these curved claws that weren't quite human. It hopped at us. It was so fast. And it swiped at Nabil, who was standing between it and Yadira. It it ripped Nabil's head off his shoulders. Then it threw it at me. Nabil's head landed at my feet. Blood was spraying everywhere from his headless body. Elissa grimaced. I've been in deep research, learning all I can about supernatural beasts, she said, but I've never heard of anything like this. Mosley took a deep breath and shook his head. It it grabbed me. It was so powerful that I couldn't shake it. I shot it point blank, blew chunks of it away just to see it heal and seemed to become stronger. A couple of my men had dropped their guns so not to shoot me by accident. They pulled their knives and began stabbing the damn thing. It would make this sound, an angry gurgle. It leaned in, opened its half mouth. It had these sharp fangs and its tongue was long and dark and it leaned in to bite me. That's when Yadira hobbled over and shoved her hand into its exposed chest and squeezed its heart. It 
oozed this thick black goo between her gnarled fingers. The nos nos screamed and let go of me. It seemed weaker, and, and it reached for her, but I grabbed its arm. She yanked out its heart and tossed it behind her. My men sensed that she was the key to killing this damn thing, so they all grabbed it and held it as tightly as they could. It thrashed about, ultimately breaking Private Benoit's arm. But Yadira reached inside her leather sack and pulled out a white stone of some sort. It gleamed in the firelight, and she shoved it into the thing's chest where its heart should be. When she did this, it dropped to the ground. Dead? Alyssa asked. Dead, Mosley said. Alyssa considered all that she had heard. She knew this nos-nos would go into the database she was compiling on supernatural creatures. She had a bit of the lore about the creature, but had a question on the weapon used to kill it. What was the stone? Mosley pulled up to a stop sign and put the cruiser in park. It's called a Dur al Najaf. It's a white gemstone found only near certain rivers in Iraq. I don't understand the magic. But a Nos Nos can live without its heart, but when you replace it with this stone, it dies. How did they dispose of the body? Elissa asked. Fire, Mosley said. We built a fire and we burned it and the jackal. Alyssa glanced out the window and noticed they were across from Lovecraft Park. She always found the park to be creepy, even in the brightest of days. Tonight, the black wrought iron fence was caked with falling snow. The ornate gate with the strange squid symbol was open, and the ornate lamppost did little to illuminate the long path that led deep into the park. She suddenly felt that they needed to get away that the entrance was open for a reason, and that something not unlike the Nos Nos would race out of the gloom and tear at their flesh. Before she could put her fear into words, Mosley put the cruiser in gear and drove away from the park. She looked out the window, processing all that Mosley had told her. She watched the flakes fall from the dark sky and wondered if she and Mosley would get to live to an old age or would be killed at the hands of some paranormal beast that lurked in the shadows of Nevermore. Not long after I got here and saw the truth of this town, I considered leaving, Mosley said as if reading her thoughts. But I came to the same conclusion that you did that we are put in situations at certain times in our lives to prepare us for more important things later. And I don't believe in coincidences, so I had no other choice to, but to believe that I was meant to be here and nevermore, fighting the good fight. So it's ultimately not up to me to worry about whether I die protecting the townsfolk or I live to be an old man. I'm meant to be here, and I'm meant to fight. So... I stay and have faith in the power that opened my eyes and gave me the skills. And at the end of the day, I'm at peace. Mosley had just put into words exactly how Alyssa felt. She had often worked through the same issue and come to the same conclusion. Agreed, she said. So, since we have a rare night of peace, what do you say we stop at Winona's for some food? My treat. Mosley smirked and cast a sideways glance at her. You realize that Winona's is where all the really crazy shit happens, right? Alyssa smiled and nodded. I do. And on a rare quiet night, you want to tempt fate and go there, Mosley said? Alyssa shrugged. Look at it this way. If anything crazy is going to happen on a quiet night like this one, it will be at Winona's. At least we'll be well fed and we can help shut it down. Mosley smiled for the first time since they'd been driving. Winona does make a damn good waffle. He drove the cruiser past the Welcome to Nevermore sign and into the snow-filled darkness, wondering if their quiet reprieve from evil would last at least for one single night.